All right, wonderful. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter number 86. Psalm chapter number 86. Right before we get started, I, 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 I have no intention of forgetting necessarily. It's just that sometimes I kind of get caught up in things. And Miss Sue reminded me, she said, Pastor, you need to, you need to mention your mother. And uh, some of you had an opportunity to meet my mother. Of course, she came to live with us for a little bit before uh, uh, the, the Alzheimer's had taken uh, a great deal of her memory. And, uh, but there were some things that she never did forget. Uh, if we started singing a song, she would know every word to that song because we had sang them for decades. And uh, in that manner, it's always interesting because <laughs> the simple thing, we couldn't remember what we had for breakfast. I can barely remember what I had for breakfast, but uh, uh, there are cer certain things that, uh, uh, that you just remember. And uh, my mother's name was Mary Evelyn Whitworth, and uh, she's been gone now for, uh, for about four years or so. And uh, is that correct? Is it three, three or four? And uh, time just goes so quickly. And, uh, but uh, I, re I remember the events and things that uh, transpired and took place. And uh, uh, mom was always a, uh, it, you understand this because as a mother, your children, you're usually a fan of them for the most part. And, uh, but uh, my mom was always in my corner. <laughs> no matter what, even if I was in the wrong, mom would, somewhat defend even if I was you know making a mess and uh, but uh, in that matter that's what moms do uh, you can rely and depend upon them now they will oftentimes tell you the truth whether you like it or not sometimes they will give you instruction uh, and you may not like it but it's still necessary and uh, because they have learned some lessons themselves that are going to make uh, you a better person if you'd listen now, uh, of course, all the little kids are gone now, and uh, it's like, Pastor, you need to go tell them that. <laughs> and so, well, hopefully they're getting that over there. But I thought what was interesting in Scripture as I was reading through here is the fact of one of the individuals in Scripture that I enjoy reading about, I, I enjoy examining his life, and I look forward to being able to, to speak with him when I get to heaven someday. And of course, uh, we all look forward to seeing Jesus, and that's not a problem at all, but there are certain individuals that were here on this earth that, that had to deal with some of the same things that you and I dealt with and, and still deal with and uh, were still able to walk closely with God because of it. And uh, in that manner, uh, David is one of them that I really enjoy uh, reading about and uh, how the Lord worked through him and to accomplish uh, the, the will of God for Israel and even to this day. As I've said before, little did that... <laughs> little fella know that that morning when he got up and as he was obeying going to take care of the sheep that day that uh, the prophet Samuel was going to show up in Bethlehem and then uh, all of his brothers would walk in front of Samuel and God would say that's not him finally as Samuel looked at his dad Jesse and David's dad Jesse there in Bethlehem and said do you have any other children because Samuel knew that God does not make mistakes God did not send him there for no reason whatsoever. There was a reason behind it. And finally, Jesse said, well, yeah, the youngest boy, but he's out tending sheep out, uh, you know, on the backside of the desert over there. And uh, Samuel said, you need to call him. And as soon as he began to approach, God said, that's him. You anoint him. So that day in front of Jesse, his father, all of his brothers, that even, by the way, when Eliab, his, one of his oldest brothers, walked in front of Samuel, Samuel himself loved God, had spoken with God many times, and had been used of God to accomplish some amazing things. Samuel himself said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And God said, no, that's not him. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. See, there's an aspect to that, two aspects. I know we look at it and say, I know God has to see our heart. That's true. But understand something, the principle is also there that says man looks on the outside. So the outside should be a representation of what's on the inside. So in that manner, of course, David comes from the backside and comes up there and he is anointed king. As I, I read through all of those things and I said, Lord, 
David's mother is not mentioned by name, but I said, is she ever mentioned in scripture? And uh, as I was uh, reading and looking, of course, it appears that it is here. And so in that manner, the impact that we see, and, and he is called David, the son of Jesse, and, and all, on and on. But you have to remember, there was a mother that took care of a number of, of the individuals that are here. And I want to show you and talk about that just a little bit, if we could, this morning. So if you found Psalm chapter number 86, we're going to read verses 11 through 17 this morning. And so if you found that, could we stand for the reading of God's word? We'll read these verses responsibly. And uh, that means I'll read the first verse if you'll join me on the next. And we'll read responsibly then down through verse number 17. Beginning in verse number 11, the Bible says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is the mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O oh, turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thine handmaiden. Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may see it, and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast holpen me, and comforted me. Notice verse 16, if you would please. The Bible says, O oh, turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of of thine handmaiden, or thine handmaiden. God uses this term many occasions. For instance, Hannah was called a handmaiden. The reason being is David is being reminded that you had a servant in my mother also. She's not mentioned a great deal, not mentioned by name, but she is here, a mother that influenced an entire world for the most part. Let's look at that a little bit this morning. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for the truth of your word. And God, I do ask that you'd please just bless now. Thank you again for all that you do. And we ask now for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's interesting because we look at David. In just a minute, we're going to turn to another passage of scripture. But I wanted you to see that even at that point, David is being reminded of as I was growing, there was somebody that had to give me instruction. Dad was influential, brothers were influential, but there was still someone that was there when they were off doing the tasks that they have to do in a day's time. The person that was going to nurture and take care of David, the king of Israel, the truth is still making an impact on this world today and still will in the future to come. Because when the Lord returns, the first time, of course, he'll, he'll, he's not going to return to the earth. He'll come in the clouds, the scripture says. The trumpet will sound, the rapture will take place, and those that have put their faith and trust in Christ will leave. Seven years of tribulation will take place on this earth. But it does say at the end of that seven years that the Lord will, that is what is known as the second coming. He will again come and physically come to this earth. The Bible says at that point, he is going to put down Satan with the word of his mouth. It's kind of interesting because I know we think, oh, the opposite of God is the devil. No, God has no opposite whatsoever. There is nothing that compares to him at all, not even close, not even in the same ballpark. He will put Satan down and, and he'll, he'll bind him for a thousand years. And the Bible says that he then, hasn't taken place yet, will sit on the throne of David. It's kind of interesting because he knows where it's at. He is already looking forward to that. It is already planned, and it's going to take place. But who influenced David in those early eight, in that early time? You know, his other brothers were influenced the same also. The brothers heard probably the same stories, lessons, and things of that nature, but there's something about that youngest child that sometimes gets a little bit of attention. If you were one of the youngest uh, in your family, and uh, I'm, the, I'm the youngest boy, and, uh, but clearly my mother loves my older brother much more than I do, and so just ask any of my brothers or sisters. But uh, 
in that instance, it's just amazing to be able to consider that David remembers and he thinks back. What are some of those things that mothers are going to teach today? Because they still have influence. They still have a part. The truth is, this past year uh, and the past couple of years, as everything has taken place in our globe, how that uh, uh, sometimes the remote learning then as the child has to stay at home, now mothers could actually hear and see some of the things that were going on and it began to get their attention. They presumed that as Johnny and Susie and Billy and, and Debbie, as in little Debbie, uh, would uh, go to school, they presumed that they're going to be taught to read and write and, and arithmetic and, and science and things of that nature. But then all of a sudden as moms were listening to some of the things that were coming across the screen there as uh, their child are in school, she, they began to think, I don't think that's exactly what I had in mind to be teaching my child. And all of a sudden now they begin to show up at, uh, at a number of places and begin to demand that things be done justly and right. And uh, in that manner, it is a reminder of this. No matter what it is, it, it, even as scripture reminds us, as a bear robbed of her whelps, that is something that was very clear, you just don't do. And you don't mess with mama bear's little ones. You just don't because it'll take a, a God-fearing woman will turn into something that is quite tragic and quite <laughs> scary at times. You start messing with the little ones. Here, David is being reminded and reminding you and I that there are some things that mom taught and discussed at times. I don't know everything. Of course, scripture doesn't give us complete clarity on some of those things. But can we conjecture just a little bit that some of the training and teaching and learning that was done by David was given to him through instruction of his mother. Let's look at one of the very first things that David began to pin down in his life. So take your Bibles, if you would, and turn back to Psalm chapter number one. Psalm chapter number one. I can perceive that it, God does things in order and he does things justly. There's a reason why God puts things in scripture the way that he does it. And as David now is beginning to jot down what you and I know as the Psalms, a lot of them were saying in the, the Middle East and during those times, but it's interesting that one of the very first things that he begins to teach, and one of the very first things that he begins to instruct, may be the things that he has heard the most in his life. May have been one of the things that he remembers the most that mom started from day one. And from day one was given some direction and instruction. And so he says, you know what, the things that I remember first, I'm going to write them down. And that's what he began to do. In verse number one, he begins, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I can imagine as David now is setting as just a young boy. There his dad is off taking care of the things there in Bethlehem. And there his mom was now giving instruction to the little ones that are there. Maybe one of the very first things that she reminded him is, you're going to be influenced by somebody, son. You better be careful who influences you. So one, you better not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You better make sure that those that you're listening to and those that are influencing you are going to be of a godly sort, are going to be those that are going to honor that God. Because just as a young man, remember, there was going to be a giant of a man that was named Goliath standing in front of Israel and was blaspheming not just Israel and not just the king, but a God that David had heard from day one, you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly are those that are going to lead you astray. The ungodly. And I imagine he stood there and as his, uh, I, I can only presume that his little brown hair and his little brown eyes are looking up at his mom as she is looking at him with intensity and saying, you don't listen to the ungodly. Do you understand me? <laughs> now, I don't know how to say that in Arabic or Hebrew. I can only say it in English and probably bad English at that. But I can, I can only imagine now as his mother is giving him very clear instruction, you stay away from the ungodly. So now as just a young boy, the youngest in the family, as he goes out to take some food as his father has instructed him, take them to your brothers as they're out in the field, as they're fighting the Philistines. And so as David gets out there and he begins to give the, I like the word that the scripture used, vittles, 
And uh, the first time I ever heard the word was on the Beverly Hillbillies. I didn't know what vittles were, but I just knew that it was something to eat. And so I is bound to be something worth eating. And, uh, but uh, in that manner, here it is. God instructs uh, David and his daddy has given him instruction to take the vittles out to his brothers. And he goes out there and he's looking and he's looking at the, what's going on. Not a whole lot happening, but all of a sudden he, as they're kind of crouching behind some rocks and debris or whatever, he goes, hey, what's going on? And all of a sudden, there's a great big booming voice that comes from across the way. And all of a sudden, a giant of a man steps out. You could tell that he was a warrior because he carried the the spear of a warrior and the sword. He was regaled in in some of the the attire of that day and his his size was just enormous. And in that manner, the thing that bothered David the most was not the fact that he was big. It wasn't the fact that he was a warrior. It wasn't the fact that he was ready to battle. The thing that bothered David the most was what was coming out of his face. He was blaspheming his God. And I can see it as it begins to stir in the bottom of him. And all of a sudden now as he is, thou and his brother saying, and tell him, I know your naughtiness. You just wanted to come see the battle. And David's thinking, yeah, I did. Really did. There's not a whole lot going on. And then all of a sudden he heard somebody beginning to defile and scream and blaspheme the God of Israel. From a young boy, he had been given instruction. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. All of a sudden, those words began to cut him. It wasn't a physical cut, but it was just as deep and just as deadly. And he looked at his brother, and his brother didn't do anything. He looked over at King Saul, and King Saul wasn't doing anything. And he looked around at the rest of them and said, Is there not a cause? Can't you hear what he's saying? They were looking at the exterior. David was looking at how big his God was. And at that point, as David then begins to stand up, he says, look, somebody needs to go knock his block off. And they said, do you look at his size? He said, I don't care how big he is. Because what was inside of David was bigger than what was coming out of him. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. I can imagine as he is looking at his brother thinking, don't you remember what you've been told? Don't you remember what you've heard? Surely you heard the same thing that mom told me. Surely you lived in the same house that I did and you remember those things. David said, well, if you're not going to do anything, I will. Just as a young man, just as he steps up now and it's like (laughs) Goliath is angry because they send a boy out to meet him. They may have sent a small size of a boy, but they sent a giant of a god And in that manner, as as he begins to blaspheme some more, David had to remind him, look, it wasn't the fact that a, he said a bear came and grabbed one of the sheep that I was tending to, had it in its mouth. Scripture tells us that. And he said, and I I killed the bear and took the the little lamb back. He said a lion came and did the same thing. He said, "I, I grabbed the lion by the beard. I think of all those videos that sin when people get too close to animals and the animals grab them. And I'm thinking, this animal didn't know he was going to get grabbed back. David killed the lion. And he reminded, it wasn't the fact that I had abilities. It was the fact there was a God. Reason being is he remembered those words. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And he understood this. If you don't fight against the ungodly, they will prevail by default. And so in that manner, don't you remember you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly? Well, yes, but he can say whatever he wants. Just leave him alone. No, I can't leave him alone. Because what he's saying is going to influence you, and it's already got you scared. See, what we don't understand sometimes is when the ungodly begin to prevail and when the ungodly speak and when the ungodly do the things that they do, if we don't, I use the term retaliate, we must very cautiously and wisely stand against those things. In that manner, that means when somebody begins to pronounce a lie, it's like you, you have to call it what it is. 
And in that manner, David said, I can't sit still when the ungodly are making noise because it's influencing and that has to stop. And in that manner, David stood up and he said, I'll use what I have. Look, it doesn't matter what you have because what you have is going to be sufficient because it's not the fact of you say, I have great abilities and I, I have a, you know. David didn't walk out there with a, a grenade launcher. He did not. He didn't walk out there with, with, you know, an M16. He didn't walk out with any type of armament in that manner. It didn't matter what it was. He could have gone out there with an, a paper airplane and Goliath would have fallen. Because it wasn't the item that he had in his hand. It was the God that he was trusting in at the time. And God was beginning to say, Is, are the rest of you just afraid? And so it took one little, one little boy that had been given instruction from a handmaiden, basically that loved God, and reminded him, you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That means that you steer clear of it. But if it's making too much noise, it may be that you just have to do something about it. And David said, it doesn't matter my size, it matters the size of God. David did step up at that plate. He took what he had. He had a sling and he had some rocks. Believe me, there are plenty of rocks in the Middle East. I've seen them personally. They're everywhere. And in that manner, he just picked up what was there and did exactly what he needed to do. And then God came along and showed up. I think it's interesting because as we see the verses here, blessed is the man. Let me ask you this. Which one of the individuals on that day was blessed the most? You, I have to remind you that David had, he had nine, eight, eight, nine brothers and at least two sisters. But the truth is, if I didn't mention one of their names, we'd have a difficult time remembering them. But we all remember David. In that manner, because he decided that I'm not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And when it's making too much noise, something has to be done and should be done. And in that manner, he re was reminded. Because we know now who the man that was blessed. Because he couldn't, let, he couldn't let the ungodly prevail. As we go on just a little bit further, we see here that he determined not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But notice as it goes on just a little bit further in verse number one, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I imagine as a young man, his mother made it clear not to do that. But number two, nor stand, or excuse me, nor standeth in the way of sinners. In that manner, he is reminded that I am not going to participate, walk in the same way that the others do. I may have to be different. I may have to be a little bit uh, different from some of the everything that's going on. It is a reminder, even as David then on that day when he was anointed king, as Samuel showed up that day, and as all of his brothers watched, David did not hear Samuel the first time say, surely the Lord's anointed is before me because the exterior looked impressive, but the interior was not everything that it needed to be. And he understood very clearly that as he is given instruction here, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. He says, I'm not going to participate in the same things that they participate in. Those that, are, that do the things that they should not do, I'm not going to participate in what they do. I'm not going to talk like they talk. I'm not going to act like they act. I'm not going to dress like they dress. I'm not going to go where they go. I'm not going to do what they do. I'm not going to say and talk and all the things. He said, there has to be a definite definition between us because even as that lesson is being taught the outside must be a representation of what's on the inside and on the inside he says I want to love God I've already been given instruction not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly that's on the inside now I need to make sure that the outside is a good representation of what's on the inside and in that manner that's exactly what David is is being taught here there's a reason why mom said, you're not going to act like that. You're not going to behave like that. You're not going to do those things. I thought it was, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, I, I think it's comical and I, I don't want to bring embarrassment, but uh, Miss Candy and, and, uh, and Brother Weaver have for a number of years uh, had taken in foster children and had, had cared for them. And uh, the children that they have now, I love them dearly. I've known them since they were just little bitty. Matter of fact, the other day I was looking through some of the, the pictures that we had. And uh, as tall as, as Logan is now, I remember when he was just a wee little bitty 
boy. <laughs> and I was looking at some of the other pictures, but one, uh, one Sunday as they were here, they had some children with them that uh, the foster care had called and said, we need some place to put them. Can you, can you take care of them for a little while? And they did. And I thought it was funny because one of the, the little girls, and I don't know if she was looking at something or had picked something up, but one of her statements was something like, we could pawn that. Do you remember that, Miss Ken? And I do too, and I'm thinking, you know, they, they, from a young age, what they have been taught sometimes sticks. <laughs> and, I, and it was just a little bit on the comical side, but there's oftentimes things that we pick up on and, uh, and children pick up on. For instance, your children sometimes when uh, maybe we're, you, you've prayed over meals and things of that nature. And uh, of course, when we end a prayer, we usually say Amen. And your children now are at the end of a meal, and uh, as young as they are, some of the first words that they learn are, amen, because that means now I can eat. That's what that means, you know. Can't eat until the amen. It's kind of comical because even as you're sitting there, the little ones, you know, you're praying, dear Jesus, please bless the food. Amen. Then they say, amen, because that means now the gate's open. Everything's clear. I can get into the food now. Because they've probably been told, no, no, you get, wait till we pray, wait till we pray. And uh, so they're sitting there, oh. and they're looking at the, the macaroni and cheese that's calling out to them, you know, and they're, and they're just waiting. And say, oh. You know, it's when dad has that long prayer, it's like, dad, you got to hurry, you're going to hurry. But you see, what folks have been given is sometimes what they begin to live by. David had been given, you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or you don't, you don't, you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you don't stand in the way of sinners. In other ways, you don't behave like they behave. You don't act like they act. You don't talk like they talk. You don't do what they do. And in that manner, David is giving very clear definition even here. I'd been given instruction not to act like the world acts. Is it shiny and is it bright and sometimes is it alluring? Yes, it is. But there's destruction at the end of it. Uh, people uh, are spending all kinds of money for entertainment and uh, maybe his mother said, I, I don't mind for you to be entertained and I don't mind for you to have amusement. I don't mind you to have those things. But just keep in mind, there is still some reality to what is necessary for you to be the kind of person you need to be. And in that manner, she goes, you're not going to act like that. You're not going to behave like that. You're not going to do those things. Maybe you as a parent have used that exact same phrase. I can remember, and I've told you before, I, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. My, uh, my dad was led to the Lord by a man. I, I still appreciate him. And to this day, uh, I, I am very grateful for one man that influenced my father to go to church with him one time because it made all the difference in the world for my family. In that manner, I can remember we just... We, we were very careful. Of it. We just didn't say words that were off color. We just didn't. Uh, and so I can remember we had a, a boy that came to school. And, uh, and he was a new kid in school. And he talked differently than some of the others. He used words that I kind of knew I wasn't supposed to use. But I wasn't sure exactly why. And he used those words. And so I determined, you know what, I'm going to try this out. I was at home. I was working on a lawnmower. I still remember it. I, I remember where I was at on the, on the front porch and everything. I've already told you my dad was well upholstered. He has always been a, a pretty good-sized fella. And uh, that was why, <laughs> you know, some, some of you skinny folks, you pull off your belt to give your child, I mean, your belt's about that, like that, and it's like they're, they're not worried at all. No, my dad was big, and I think he did it in purpose because when he pulled off his belt, it was this long, folded over. And so it's like he can reach for a long way off. You know? And if, you, if you've never done the, the spanking dance where they get your arm and, you know, you get whooped and you go, I, you say, oh, pastor, you shouldn't talk like that. You know, maybe it's just needed. Maybe you need a whooping. Maybe you've not, maybe you've not had a spanking in a good while. But uh, in that manner, I, I can remember. I had, I had heard uh, the, the boy's first name was John. And uh, I heard John use those words at school. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try one of these and just see if it's how it works out. I, I was working on the lawnmower motor. 
And uh, I can still remember it because I, I should have had a boxed-in wrench, but I had a crescent wrench, you know, the knuckle skinners. And sure enough, I'm putting pressure on this thing, and all of a sudden, it slips on that bolt, and my knuckles catch the end of the concrete porch that I was on. And in that manner, I decided this is a good time to try that new word. And I did. And in seconds, as big as my dad was across the way over there, he was right up in my face. And I still remember what he was saying. I could smell the aqua velva that he had on. And he said, we are not going to talk like that. We are Christians. You are not going to use that kind of language. Do you understand me? And you know, dad didn't get real wound up about a great deal. He really didn't. But that he did. Dad was pretty calm about everything. I mean, he really didn't get too worked up over much. Except later on in life, he got involved with politics. I'm not going to tell you what he thought. <laughs> but in that manner... I can remember he was right there and he was making it very clear that we're not going to act like that. We're not going to talk like that. Even to this day, I've, to, I've spelled it for you, but I'm not, I don't say it and I'm not going to say it because <laughs> he may come back from heaven here all of a sudden and say, I told you once, son, we're not talking like that. He said, oh, right here on Mother's Day, you're making me come down here. <laughs> but in that instance, we are not going to stand in the way of sinners. Here is David is a young man. He is being reminded by his mother, you're not going to act like the world. You're not going to behave like the world. Yes, it may be impressive. Yes, it may be influential. Yes, you may be allured to it, but we're not going to do it. Do you understand me? Yes, mama, I do. Son, there's a king inside of you, but he'll never come out if you behave like the rest of them. He is never, you'll never be what you're supposed to be. Now, just as any mother would look at a child and say, you can be anything and you're going to be something someday. Moms believe those things because they're hoping and they're believing that if I put good in, that good can be produced. But, he all, but the, every mother knows that if they're influenced by bad, bad will show up also. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, and then, of course, it says, but son, you're not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. You're not, you're not going to talk like others talk. And you're not going to be spiteful. You're not going to be just constantly critical. You're going to use your words for something better than just a tear down. In today's society, and you know very well, I don't post a great deal on anything. I just don't. It may be to my detriment to some degree, but I just don't. I don't read some of the comments. I don't. Even on our, uh, our YouTube page where the messages get posted, I told Brother Stark, you can turn the comments off. I'm not interested. I'm not going to read them. I'm just not. I very rarely uh, read any. Once in a while, I'll send somebody a happy birthday. But if you've not gotten a happy birthday from me in, in a year or two, it's because I just don't go on. <laughs> I don't go on Facebook very often. I just don't. Or, or Twitter or what's some of the other ones? Shame on you for knowing. That's what it is. So, but uh, in, that, in that manner, it's one of those things. I, I, I just don't because there is so much negative there is so much, you say, there's a lot of positive too. I'm grateful for it. I'm glad that it could be used for that. But it's a shame that there's some folks that they just wait to, for you to say, the sky is blue, and their answer is, no, it's not. <laughs> His mother's saying, you are not going to be scornful because you are never going to do. Can I ask you who wrote the most chapters in the Bible? David. He wrote an amazing amount and influenced his son Solomon to write some amazing things too. But as she sat there and she says, your words are going to be used for construction, not tearing down. Even to a point as a young man, Saul said, I want him to come to the palace and I want him to play and sing for me because it soothes my soul. David's words were going to be something that was monumental. How many of us have heard often, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. How many of us have stood at the, in the funeral home as a loved one is placed there and those words have been a comfort? How many times has the words that David spoke been something that encouraging, 
that motivates, that it soothes our soul. Because as a young boy, he was instructed, your words are not going to be just scornful and spiteful. They're going to be something that builds and something that instructs and something that is a benefit to the next generation. Now when we need our soul to be soothed somewhat, we run to the Psalms. Even as David wrote down, search me, O God, and know. And we read those things because as the son of a handmaiden of, as David said, thine handmaiden. As his mother said, son, you're not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not going to stand in the way of sinners. You're not going to seat in the, and you're not going to be in the seat of the scornful. You're not going to talk like everyone talks. You're not going to behave like everyone behaves. And you're not going to believe like everybody else does. You may be odd. You may be different. But let me tell you something. Kings sometimes are going to have to be that way. Did she know he would be? No. She just believed that he could be something greater than the average. And David at that point determined, I will. I, I jotted down uh, just one, two, three, four, five things. Just quick. I'm just going to read them. That's all I'm going to do. David had determined that he's going to have the right associations. He's going to have the right associations. He is going to have the right activities. He'll have the right activities. He would have the right attitude. He would have the right attitude. He would have the right appetites for what he desired. And he would have the right affections for what was going to be the desire of his soul. And in that manner, as he states there in Psalms, in just that one little place in chapter number 86, the son of thine, thine handmaiden. Maybe David remembered as his mother said, son, you're going to be something someday. But you will never be if you don't get things squared away. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Do not stand in the way of sinners. And do not sit in the seat of the scornful. Those are destructive as mothers today are giving instruction to their children, as they are giving direction, as they are giving some how, to, some how to live some life lessons to that next generation, I hope moms today would do that very same thing because kings are being developed. Amazing leaders are being developed, even to a point where some men would, would literally say, as David came to one point as they were fighting the battles, he looked at a well that was in Bethlehem and he let his mind run back to the time that he drew water out of that well and drank from it. And he said, oh, if I could just have a drink from that well again. But the Philistines had a garrison all around Bethlehem, his hometown. Some of his mighty men said, if David wants a drink from that well, we'll get him a drink. We could rationalize, he's got water, he doesn't need water. It wasn't the fact that he needed water, it was the fact he wanted something. The Bible says that those men fought through and got a drink from that well and brought it back to David. David realized this is not just water that I would be partaking of. This is literally the life and commitment and the dedication of these men. Little did that mother know that when she was telling him, don't <laughs> make sure that you understand that you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You don't stand in the way of sinners and you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. That one day David would be influential in that manner, even to a point where others would, would put their life on the line for him. Just a drink of water? It's amazing what the truth of God will do in the life of a young person. Invest invest, invest. Because mothers have the opportunity to do some amazing things and to produce some amazing kings and leaders. But it takes the truth to do it. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today. Lord, the influence that a mother has sometimes is monumental. And God, I do ask that you'd please just help. Thank you again for all of the mothers that we have. And God, I do ask that you'd please help us now to do the part that we should for the next generation, to stand stalwart, to do what we can to accomplish your will. But God, all of it will be in vain if we don't begin to teach that next generation the importance and the impact of walking with you. So Father, I do ask that you'd please just bless now. Thank you again for all that you do. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just work. 
with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, the first question this morning is this. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Jesus made a way so that you and I would never have to face that awful place that's called hell. By the way, it was not created for mankind. It was created for the devil and his angels. But mankind will go there if he does not trust Christ as Savior. But Jesus made a way and did exactly what was necessary to accomplish the task of giving you a home in heaven. But it takes an opportunity for you to say, would you save me? The Bible made it very clear that it's available to you. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If not, I'd love to take a Bible and show you exactly what it means to trust Christ as Savior. And God made it available to all mankind and made it so that all mankind could accept it. In that manner, that's offered to you and I today. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Have you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? But then second, number two, have we been doing our job? Have we been doing what we should to make sure that that next generation knows not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, not to stand in the way of sinners, and not to sit in the seat of the scornful? In that manner, do you see how it progresses? One minute you're walking, then you're sitting, and then you're just standing. Uh, you're standing, then you're sitting. You begin to slow down the further you get away from God. But in that manner, God is making it very clear to you and I today. We have an obligation and we have an opportunity to do something amazing. Mothers, your influence is paramount. It makes a difference in the life to come. Thank you for it. We honor you for it. But we need you to consistently continue to do it. We just need to... All of us need to walk with God. We just do. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. If you've never trusted Christ, as soon as the music plays, there'll be others that are coming towards the altar. If you'll just step out, get my attention, I'll have somebody take a Bible and show you exactly what it means to be saved. You don't have to leave today not knowing. But at the same token, you say, I have trusted Christ as Savior, Pastor. Well, maybe it's time that you and I just determine I'm going to do what I should to not only rear my children, but to be the influence that I should for right. I've got to do it. I've got to. Maybe that's your prayer today. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed as the instrument begins to play. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, the altar's open. You may come.